All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Narupta Netram, who is in Southwest Florida. How are you doing, Narupta? I'm great, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, that's fantastic. And uh, and uh, Narupa is a, a diversity and inclusion consultant, trainer, and speaker. And what we're going to talk about today is how can I tra- attract top talent uh, to grow my business? And what do we mean by top talent in the first place? And like, are you are you being, uh, you know, as the world changes, generations come in, different backgrounds, all of that, how, how broad is the... Uh, how broad is the talent pool that you're actually looking at? So um, let's get straight into it uh, here. When people look, I mean, most people recruit in a very traditional manner, right? You know, they put together a job description and then they go and say, okay, they hand it off to HR or somebody and they go find somebody who fits this profile. You know, really is there a lot of um, strategic thought behind that piece? And I think there needs to be more thought behind the piece of the job description, because that's the first thing that a job seeker sees and notices about your company. Typically, they're looking for a job and they're seeing that job posting. So they're reading your job description and you want to make sure that your job description conveys that you're a diverse workplace, that you're equitable and that you're inclusive company. And it's key for the job descriptions to have only the job responsibilities that are required. So many times I see job descriptions that go on for pages and pages and you think, is all that really necessary? And again, with the qualifications, the same thing, are all those qualifications really required of this job? And I think about, you know, folks should be thinking about all this diversity that's out there and how do they do they want to attract this talent Mm -hmm. and so the Uh, way that the job description is built really matters yeah i know there's a couple of things i just wanted to i wanted to pick up on is uh is number one you're correct is like having an insane amount of of responsibilities i always say to people um, job description there's only uh, there's only one line that really matters and that's like ev- and anything else your manager may require you to do <laughs> so I always say like put in the if you're putting a job description put in the high level responsibilities and then put in that comment uh, and you'll be good to go but the other thing is really interesting there what you just said is you know with those list of you know qualifications because I've talked to some other people particularly people who specialize in in you know helping women uh, succeed in the workplace, and they say there's a psychological thing. Like a man generally will look at ten qualifications, and he'll sort of see, oh, I kind of fit two of them. Good, I'm applying. Uh, a woman will look at them and say, ooh, I only have one or two of these. I won't apply. So it's a it's an interesting psychological thing there, and I think that also you know, when you're putting too many things maybe on your job description, you're frightening off some of the population. You are, and the terminology you just used, you know, made me think of one of the things that also shouldn't be in job description is gender coded wording, and sometimes I still see that in job descriptions. You know, you want to make sure that your job description is inclusive and that begins with the choice of words. Right, so give me some examples of that. So for people who are listening, who may be unaware of what that means in practice and may be unconsciously doing it. It may be simple things as, you know, masculine sounding words or using the word he, people often assume and still writing with that, but you want to go with a more neutral tone and avoid those masculine sounding words that maybe somebody's going to read your job description and say, just based on this, I don't think I fit this description. So you want to be careful of your choice of wording. Yeah, you no, know, things great... like policemen, for example postmen they're all outdated yeah. terms 
Yeah, no, that, no, absolutely, and I, I think those are those are simple things that people can can address um, pretty easily. Um, but what else is it? What what else can you do? You know, let's, we talked about the job description and all of that. What else can you do to attract a a more you know a to more talent rich pool of people? I was like, to, I don't like to say diversity for the sake of it because I think you want talent rich, and I think talent rich means people of all different backgrounds and whatever bringing various extra things to the table. You want to include a statement just like you said there, John. You want to say something about that you are welcoming of all backgrounds, of all races, gender. And there are certain languages that there are legal requirements that some of those words be in there. But you want to project that you are a welcoming and inclusive place where employees can feel a sense of value and they belong. The job description should make me want to come work for your company. Yeah, and I also think the other thing too is uh, is that also setting setting the expectations of what's expected. So yeah, it may be you know it may have a great great diversity, great welcoming, all of that, but it's results oriented. So um, I I think you also have to balance the two. Is like yeah, it, this is a great welcoming place, but you'll be expected to deliver results, um, and so. You know, not going. I always think it's always a fine balancing act there of of making sure that you keep both elements in play. Absolutely, and I've seen some companies even put some of the goals in the job description. Here's what expected from you at month six, at year one, and that gives you a good sense of of what you're going to accomplish and can you accomplish it in that time period. Yeah. And I think there's an, there's another thing, uh, and you obviously, you know, because you, you work in this space and you spend a lot of time in it, is, I mean, the work the work environment, I was going to say the workplace, but that's even an anach anachronism today because the workplace could be just about anywhere in the world. Uh, the, the work environment now with being, you know, a lot of a lot of hybrid workers, remote workers, whatever, it has allowed a lot of organizations to access talent from all over the globe from, you know, people in very different circumstances. But in order to be able to leverage that, you have to, as you said, you have to make it uh, you have to make that a comfortable experience for those who are joining the company. And maybe if somebody is joining virtually from a completely different country and culture, you need to understand a little bit more about that to ensure that you can provide them with what they need to be successful. Absolutely, because now so many more companies are going to the remote model, a hybrid model. So you want to be sure that your job description can be understood by someone from any country in the world, especially when you're offering a remote opportunity. Yeah, and and how do you uh, and and when, when you when you're advising or, or working with people, like how how do you ensure then that? Um, not just the language is taken care of, but the whole recruiting process itself is uh, is is more open and more friendly to to a, a greater audience of people. Because again, just like we said with the job descriptions and stuff, I mean, you know, recruitment tends to be a very traditional. It's followed a very traditional model, and you know, there's a lot of people in HR who you've been doing it for years. And, but I feel like to achieve what you're talking about here is that the, the process itself has to change as well, not just the language, you know, not just ticking the boxes, but the pro process itself needs to change. It does. And one of the things I recommend from my clients is that look at where you're recruiting talent from. Is it the traditional sources you've always relied on? I think now is the best time to think outside of the box and look at different types of colleges. You know, there's some professions and jobs that they only recruit from Ivy League schools. But why? There is diverse talent everywhere. So I think expanding where folks are looking for talent is critical. And for me, another aspect is the moment you send the introductory email inviting someone for an interview or even a rejection email. You need to build inclusivity in there. I mean, we've all seen those job rejections and they have lines like, oh, we found someone that's a better fit. Why are we still using that word fit? 
don't we want to hire folks that are going to strengthen and enhance our workplaces? I don't want to fit into somebody's workplace. I want to bring value. Yeah, that's a great point. Actually, I never thought of that. That's a that's a that's a very insightful point there um, about that. Yeah, yeah, you're not the right fit. Yeah, you don't want somebody to just be to be a fit. You want them to be an addition. You want them to stretch you. You want them to bring things that, uh, you know, you want them to surprise you rather than just fit in, right? In a good way, obviously. Exactly. Yeah. And one other thing you just mentioned there, I, I wanted to come back on is this idea of colleges. And and as you can tell, I, I'm 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 not from America originally. Like I'm I'm from I'm from Ireland, and uh, you know I did go to college and get degrees and all of that. But I do think here, as you said, is like people get very very hung up on colleges. As you said, like maybe they only recruit from Ivy Leagues or these big college you know colleges. And to be honest. Whenever I looked at at, at um, resumes and them in the past, I I could care less where somebody went to school. I care about their skill set. I care about what they've achieved. I mean, you can go to an Ivy League college and do a you know a Mickey Mouse degree and you know not be very you know not be that great, or you could go to a small college, do a really good thing, and be fantastic. So I really do think it's something culturally in America that needs to change, and that's this this hang up on college. It is, and and not only the hang up with college. Just to just to you know finish out on the on the college piece. Like I did work at a place one time, and that was a, the HR policy was that you could not recruit somebody who didn't have a college degree. And I used to go crazy because I'd see these resumes of people with phenomenal, um, phenomenal skills and jobs, and they'd done. And I'd be always arguing with uh, HR, going, "What's with this college thing? Seriously." Yes, think about all the great leaders, and many of them do not have a college degree. I think in today's, you know, it's 2022, we need to be looking at what people have accomplished and their potential, not what boxes they check. I'll see job descriptions that require 10 years of experience, let's say even in the field of diversity. I've been dealing with diversity my whole life. I'm a female, I'm Indian, I'm immigrant. I have life experiences. While I have professional experience in the area also, my life experiences should count as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that absolutely. I think that should account for a lot because at the end of the day, the people who are really successful in, in jobs and in business, you know, a lot of it comes from the life experience uh, as opposed to, as you said, just checking, checking some boxes and uh, and I do think you know we, that that is an area we fall down. And yeah, like you said, you know, you need ten years experience. I mean, ten years experience. Come on. I mean, to be honest, there's statistics nowadays where you know the younger people in the workforce they don't stay in jobs longer than two two to three years. So if you're saying, you know, they may have jumped around, they may be highly talented, but they're never going to have the ten years experience you're looking for. Exactly. And with the great resignation happening, you know, folks are more selective on who they want to work for not who's going to hire them but who do they choose to work for i and i i, I love that point uh, you raised that point as well because i think that is that's key as well uh i i think i've said this many times but i think this started around uh, at the time of the the, the financial crisis um, you know 2008 or whenever that was um because I think then people started to look at their circumstances and say, OK, why am I moving to a high cost area, having a big mortgage, a long commute to be close to this to this office building that I work in? And then the first time there's a sign of trouble, something happens. Guess what? We all get laid off and we get stuck in high cost areas with high mortgages. So uh, to your point. I think people are getting more comfortable now. We're going, this is where I'm going to live. This is the lifestyle I want. And then I'll find the company that can accommodate me. I agree. I think it's definitely an employee's market. And I think employers have to recognize that and think differently about how they are going to attract employees, keep them, develop them, and make that make them feel that sense of value and belonging in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. And I think probably the other thing that's often overlooked is when you do recruit, you know, people from different backgrounds is 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 overlooking, as you said, 
the rich experiences that they may bring because of their backgrounds, things that nobody else would know about, things that nobody else would have been exper have been exposed to or whatever. But actually harnessing that because that helps you to learn more about a, a whole like segment of people that maybe you want to to service in the future. Right. And I think I see also a lot of folks having various careers like me. I started out as an attorney. I then became an executive. I then became an entrepreneur. So looking at the things that people have accomplished, again, looking at their potential based on their past accomplishments is really critical. Yeah. Uh, and so how do you advise people when maybe they're going to the interview process, when they're interviewing candidates? How, how do you advise them to be able to draw out more of that and focus more on those elements as opposed to just doing a resume review? I think giving careful thought to the questions that you're asking and making sure that your questions are consistent for each candidate and not asking the standard questions, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Being more inclusive and thoughtful about your questions and this person's experience, because you wanna get at things of how they've handled challenges. How do they celebrate successes? What type of leader are they? Are they a collaborative leader? Which is what most folks want nowadays. They don't yeah. want the dictator anymore. Yeah, and and you just and, and and some more great points there that you made. Yeah, when I when I used to interview a lot of people, is I used to always do that. There was two questions like that I always asked them was one was like a project initiative or something that you were the driving force for that was successful and tell me all about it and blah blah blah. And the other one was something that you were the driving force for that was an absolute disaster and what did you learn from it and how did you cope with that? And I always preface it by saying. I don't want you to give me one where it looks like it, it went wrong, but then you turned it into something like, I don't want that. I want the one where you absolutely crashed and burned because that's what I want to hear about. Exactly. You want to learn how people handle successes and how they handle failure, because inevitably those two things are going to happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just just in general, um, just in general, are there any things that people can do? We, we've talked about job description. We've talked about the interview process. But what else, what are some other things people, companies can do to uh, attract a more diverse talent pool? I think celebrating your diversity, inclusion and equity and any other, you know, inclusive type practices. Like I go to the company's website. What is there about these topics? What are you talking about in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Is there a statement? Is there more than a statement? Because so many companies have issued statements, you know, given the, given the worldwide events that have happened and the world's reaction to them. But it needs to be more than a statement. What programs are you having for your employees? How are you showcasing the diversity of your employees? I've seen companies put videos highlighting, you know, maybe them celebrating a diversity holiday, for example. So you want people to come to your website and feel that they belong there and it's a place where they want to work. Yeah, and no, no, I agree. Um... Part of the problem there, though, I think is sometimes that it, it, there's definitely some companies it comes off as slightly disingenuous, maybe that they're just they're doing it because they think it's a good, you know, it's a good thing to do from a per, from a from a, per, you know, outside perspective or whatever. It's good to be seen to be doing these things, but there's no real nothing really behind it. Right. Another thing a lot of companies are doing are sharing their reports on their goals related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's another thing to look for, not just a statement, not just videos. What is this company doing to advance diverse talent, to attract diverse talent, to keep diverse talent? 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely, and I, I think that's uh, I think that's a key piece to it. Obviously, that the whole measurement piece. So, listen, this has been uh, this has been absolutely fascinating. Fascinating, Nurupta. Uh, all of uh, Nurupta's information is going to be below this video, so you can find out more. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. So, I founded Lotus Solutions LLC to help businesses in all industries across the globe create diversity and inclusion to ensure a fair and just workplace. I do customized trainings, consulting, keynote speeches, speeches, and it's all about really providing value for people to become better leaders and better employees. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, I would encourage people to go check out check out Nerupta's uh, website and uh, check out the services. Uh, this is, you know, the world is is evolving and changing. And as I said, with the new work practices, I mean, the whole the whole globe is potentially your recruitment, uh, you know, your pool of talent. So you need to start learning on how to how to interact with with people from very, very different backgrounds and across the whole spectrum. So I think it's a it's an exciting time for you. I think there's going to be a lot of people coming to you looking for help. Nerupta. Thank you. I'm ready to help. Yeah, absolutely. All right. My name is John Golden. Thank you for listening or watching. And I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.